Yeah. Yeah. Vince, are the kids starting out out here? No. Oh. Okay. All right. Am I on? You guys hear me okay? All right. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, little kiddos, if you want to go back with Sally today, I see he's like going back there. You want to go back? Like this donut. You know, you know. Uh, when you're ready, you can go. They'll be back. Okay. Um, Kelly? You no? Know? All right. Um, I forgot. All right. Well, I hope everybody had a wonderful Christmas. We're actually still going to be singing Christmas songs for a little while. We are in Christmas. Oh, also, I forgot, teens, if you guys want to go back there, we sing a couple of songs. Lori's back there. She had to listen to me, so if you want to go back, we're going to go to that, too. Um, we're going to be in Christmas at least for uh, a couple of more weeks. You know, technically, you know, Christmas lasts until the epiphany. And for a lot of folks that don't know, even though, like, we get so excited in the world today to start, you know, putting up our Christmas trees, like, you know, at the end of September and playing Christmas music, you know. In, in early November, and then Christmas comes and everyone like pulls the plug on everything, when the reality is the season of Christmas for the church lasts until Epiphany. And if you hear the song, The 12 Days of Christmas, the 12 days of Christmas don't start on December 13th and end on the 25th. The 12 days of Christmas start on Christmas Day and then go for 12 days beyond. So today, technically, you'd all be getting two turtle doves, right? So, which represent the whole of the New Testament. So we'll still be singing Christmas songs for a few weeks. A couple of quick, so I hope you guys all had a wonderful day yesterday. Just a couple of quick announcements um, uh, before we get, we get started for, for youth group in particular. So we'll start posting the dates of what's coming up. Uh, in the month of January, we're gonna have a regular youth group class on January 16th. And then on January 29th, we will be back at the Dog Warden's office. Um, helping out there, and this time we're actually going to be doing work, I told you. So it's not going to just be chilling, but this time we're actually going to do stuff with them on the 29th. Um, then I will communicate the February calendar on the regular classes. Um, we're going to have two events on February 9th. We're going to be going to serve dinner at the Haven of Rest. And then I think it's February 20th, I could be wrong. I got us a cool opportunity to serve at a community event for a chili cook-off that the Lions Club is putting on, and they needed some help. And I said, you know, what a cool way for the youth group to come help out. So, I mean, it's as much chili as we want. <laughs> Perfect. So, so that'll be coming up. We'll have details on that too. But like I said, this year my focus is really gonna be to get us to do at least one service project a month. So, I'm just out there looking around for ways that we can be serving the community and out the community. Also, college age kids, since I see a few of them in here today, this week, um, Sally is gonna be putting together some information to get kind of a college group together going, okay? So look for that, that'll, that'll be starting up here. Really, the birth of that was that we have some great college age kids that I, I really wanna see get together and meet. But we had two, I think three seniors that actually said, Vince, can we keep meeting even after we graduate? And I said, well, we've got to put a group together for that then. So that'll, that'll be coming up too. Um, so, so watch for that also this week as it's coming up. I think that, oh, also the night starts our Bible study on Sunday nights. I um, We gave away, we gave away, we already bought uh, one slug of books that are all gone. I have another 15 books that should be here before next Sunday. And then the Bible study itself starts on January 9th. Okay. And all that information is in the bulletin. It's also on Facebook. It's also in the email and all that good stuff too. All right. Um, I think that's it. Welcome to people that we got visiting here today, which is always awesome. To our out-of-staters, not only do we have to say welcome, but Laura and Jasmine are here. Today is actually the Lord's birthday. So I think we should all say happy birthday. Lord. So can we sing? Sure, you can help out. Okay, here we go. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Laura, happy birthday to you. Hey, all right, that was pretty good. All right, well with that, brothers and sisters, it is a great day to be in the house of the Lord. 
why don't you stand with me as we open up our worship service with some songs. Please turn in your hymnals to page 181.
Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. We thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who was coming to this world, incarnate as a person, all of us, living his life as both man and God for us. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Help us to be more like you every day. Let us count ourselves worthy before you because of your grace and because of your love and because of your sacrifice for us. We love you so much, Jesus. As we gather here and we lift our prayers, Lord, we lift up to you all of the people that we're praying for. In particular, Lord, and with, with loud and, and humble hearts, we lift up to you our brother Clark, who's still struggling in the hospital. Lord, please be with him. Let your healing touch be upon him and comfort all of those that are praying for him. Lord, we lift up to you our brother Bill and his daughter-in-law, Crystal, who's still in the hospital, Lord. And we pray for her as well. Pray that you would watch and be with her and the doctors that are helping her. And all of the other people that we have on our prayer list, we lift up to you. We lift up to you the prayers that are on our hearts, Lord, that we haven't even spoken. Because you know them, Lord. And there is no place we can hide from you. We pray that you would give us comfort and give us ear to what we turn to you. We pray for our church. We pray for the gifts that we receive today, Lord, that they're given generously and cheerfully, knowing that all things come from you and all things return to you. We pray for our community. We pray for, for everyone that we serve and minister to and everyone who hears this message, that we as a church are fulfilling the mission that you've given us, Lord, to share the gospel, to share the good news of Jesus with everyone that we can. Strengthen us in that direction, Lord. And as we close our time of prayer, we lift up our voices to you together as brothers and sisters in the faith, and we all pray with one voice the words our Savior gave us. And pray with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand and turn in your hymnal to page 196.
So as a little bit of an update of what we're going to be doing now that the Christmas season, is, now that we're past Christmas and we're into the season of Christmas and moving forward now into Epiphany and Advent, or excuse me, Latin, all these things, we are going to be for the next few months in the Gospel of Mark. We're going to be in the Gospel of Mark, and, and I'm excited for it because the Gospel of Mark is a rather enigmatic gospel for a lot of reasons. It's one of my favorites, uh, probably my favorite book in the Bible. I know I say that all the time, but it's one of my favorites. It's a great book. We're going to be in Mark up until Easter, and then after Easter, we are going to do, well, I'm planning on doing it. We're going to do a series on Revelation after after Easter. So that that's kind of the plan of where we're at right now. Um, for Mark today, we're going to spend a few weeks in chapter 1, because there's a lot in chapter 1. Today, we're just going to go over a portion of it, and um, after that, uh, we'll be going through chapter 1 for a few weeks. Um, we'll go through the, the rest of the gospel as much as we can until Easter. So for today, we're going to be looking at John and Jesus. We're going to be looking at the relationship of John the Baptist and Jesus. We're going to be in Mark chapter 1. And we're going to read verses 1 through 11. Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. This was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love with you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended to him. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Be with us today as we look to understand your word more closely. Lord, fill this place with the Holy Spirit. Fill our hearts with the Holy Spirit, that we may be tender to the leading of your and fill our minds and our ears with the Holy Spirit, that we may be open to learn your word, so that we may know your word, that we may love your word, and that we may live your word. And we ask for this in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So a lot of this morning's message is actually going to be background on the Gospel of Mark. We're going to get a lot of background, a lot of context on the Gospel of Mark. So that we really understand what we're going to be studying and what we're going to be reading for the next several months. Okay, um, it's a fascinating gospel. In fact, what I would like to challenge all of you, you know, at starting the beginning of the well, we'll get into it actually. I'm now I'm starting to jump ahead. I, know, I get excited, but the gospel market, it's fascinating. So let's give some really good context, and then we're going to talk about what just happened in the portion of scripture that we read. So the Gospel of Mark, some background. First off, also, I noted, too, um, the, the outline for this week's message is very short because I put it together, and then after I put it together, I said, no, I need to include a bunch more stuff. So there's a lot of stuff in here that the outline doesn't have, so just follow along and make notes. And it'll be online. You can catch it again. So let's give some good background here on the Gospel of Mark. First off, the Gospel of Mark. While anonymous, right, Mark does not identify himself as the author in the writings. But the gospel is attributed to John Mark, who was a, a, a uh, close member, close friends with the apostles. He was very close with, with Peter. In fact, in First Peter, Peter writes about John Mark. And the questioning of Mark being the author really has never been challenged, right? 
But a, a lot of that is due to the fact that this gospel focuses a lot, and there's a lot of stories about Peter. So it would make sense that it was written by someone very close to him. It was written between 60 and 70 AD. And it is the earliest of the Gospels. It is, is the, the, the earliest written of all the Gospels. In fact, we touched a little bit on it on Christmas Eve. Even though chronologically Mark was written first, Matthew was placed first in the New Testament by the earliest church fathers because of the genealogy in the book of Matthew. So the first thing you would understand was Jesus' genealogy. But Mark's was written, this Gospel was the earliest of the Gospels written. Another interesting thing about this gospel, it's the shortest of all the gospels written. It's, it's a short gospel, and it's fast-paced compared to the other gospels. In fact, you're going to notice a lot, and I'll tell you this, as you're reading it both here at church and reading it on your own at home, every time you see the words immediately or at once, circle it. Because all through this gospel, you see that terminology used, immediately Jesus did this, then immediately this happened. Then at once we went. You see that a lot. There is this like urgency to the gospel. It's fast paced. It's a gospel of action. And it makes sense that it's a gospel of action because the primary audience for the gospel of Mark was a Roman Gentile audience. It was not primarily written to a Jewish audience. It was written primarily to a, to a, 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 a Gentile audience, a Greco-Roman audience. Now think about this. So just so you can see the, how the pieces all fit together, what do we know about the Roman Empire? This was an empire that was always on the move, right? They were always conquering, accomplishing. They built uh, the, the, the works like the Colosseum all over the place. They built a, a network of roads, the Apian Way, that connected all of the empire by foot. You can actually still walk it today, right? You can still walk that. I, I walked on a, a small stretch of it in Rome. These were people that were moving. They were always, they were busy. They had stuff going on, even in their activities. What did they like to do in their activities? They went to chariot races. They went to the Colosseum and saw, you know, gladiators fighting each other. So it made sense that, that the way Mark wrote this gospel was so that, he, because he understood his audience, he was writing it in such a way that it would capture them and that it would, it would make them understand it better. Chapters one through eight are, are almost frenetic in the pace that it keeps. There's almost a frenzy to it. It's the first eight chapters, the story after story of just astonishing deeds, exorcisms, healing, miracles, walking on water, calming the storm. It's absolutely incredible what's going on in the first eight chapters. In fact, I, I titled this whole series, Jesus, God of Wonders, because you almost get the sense that like, you know, that like Superman showed up, right? That, that it's just, it's incredible what's happening. And of course, all of these incredible signs are representing, they are alluding to the fact that there has been an inbreaking of the kingdom of God on earth, right? In fact, in verse 10 of what we read, when the, when the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove, what did it say? It said that the heavens were torn open. They were torn, but not that the heavens opened, they were torn open. It's, it's, giving you, it's giving us this imagery of the kingdom of God divinely, with, with like a divine uh, action, with, with, a, with a divine frenzy, right? He's, he's di the kingdom of God is divinely now penetrating the created realm. This is not something average. This is not something ordinary. The heavens were torn open. They were torn open for the Holy Spirit to come down. This was something heavenly. This was something divine. This was something that had not before been seen. Mark, since he was the, the first of the, of the gospel writers, actually pioneered the genre that we call a gospel, right? It's its own genre. Understand that when you read the gospel, we are not reading a biography of Jesus. We're not reading a straight historical account. If this were a biography, right, like in the way that we understand a biography, they would have taken care to include stories of Jesus' childhood, 
of what Jesus' hobbies were when he was a kid, uh, of what Jesus did as he was growing up. We don't have those in the Gospels because the Gospels aren't meant to, to impart that information. And there's a bunch of reasons for it. For starters, writing back then was difficult and every word had to mean something, right? They're not like me. Like when I sit down to write, I've got a beautiful moleskin journal that's got, you know, 36 gram weight milled paper. I've got a, a nice fountain pen with ink that just flows right onto the page. I've got this really nice light that I can adjust so that it doesn't hurt my eyes as I'm writing. These folks were sitting somewhere in the dark, maybe by a candle like this, with the bone of an animal that was sharpened that they were dipping and then writing with it. So every word counted, right? This is not a biography, it's a gospel. So what's the point of a gospel? Well, why write a gospel? Well, what is the point of the genre? And I think we all need to understand this as we're gonna be going through the gospel of Mark. The point of the gospel is to convey the following to us as Christians. The first point of the gospel is to explain to the community of believers why Jesus was here, what his intentions were, when we read the Gospel of Mark and all the other Gospels, but when we read the Gospels, it becomes clear why Jesus was here. Jesus was the one. He was the Messiah. He fulfilled the prophecies of all the old prophets. And here's all the evidence. So that's the first thing, to explain to the community the attention to Jesus. Secondly, the, a Gospel is there to impart with the community why Jesus has the authority that he has and why the apostles have the authority that they have. You understand that Jesus' authority comes from being the Son of God and the apostles' authority comes from Jesus imparting that, that authority upon them. The third reason, or the third uh, um, uh, point of writing the gospel was to show the community of believers the significance of the defeat of what seemed like the tragic life of Jesus, right? For all those around when Jesus was crucified, at the end, you know there were a lot of people that sat around and was like, so what was the point of this? Well, the gospel explains to us what the point was and why it all had to happen and how it was fulfilled at the end, right? It gives us that information. The gospel is also written to communicate the promise of God's future actions. To, to let the believers know that there would be vindication for God with this, earth, with this world, that there would be a redemption of creation, that there would be a redemption of God's people. And lastly, the point of a gospel is to provide guidelines for how brothers and sisters in the faith are supposed to live. If we didn't have the gospels, how would we know what we were supposed to do? All the lessons that Jesus taught, the Sermon on the Mount, of how we're supposed to live, that all came from the Gospels. So that's why it was there. It's every single nook and cranny of, of the history of what happened with Jesus in there. No, no, but it's not, supposed, it's not supposed to be there. That's not the Gospels' point. The Gospels' point is to communicate to us who Jesus was, why it was, why it was important, and how we're supposed to live. So as you read the Gospel of Mark, keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Mark also, the Gospel of Mark, going back to the fact that it's fast and urgent and all that, Mark does not include a birth story. He does not include a nativity story or a birth narrative. Mark, Matthew, and Luke do. What we read here, Jesus just seems to show up on the scene. John's baptizing and Jesus just shows up on the scene in his ministry. And he's ready to go. In fact, in verse 15, which we'll get to next week, Jesus' first words are, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is near. Repent. Boom. Yeah, like, there's no intro. There's no waiting. We're going. Like we're, we're moving on with the story. In this gospel, in the gospel of Mark in particular, Jesus is often seen extending God's grace to the Gentiles. And you'll see so many miracles and so many ways where the Gentiles are, are used as an example by Jesus. Jesus, in this Gospel of Mark in particular, extends his grace to the poor, to the sick, to the dispossessed, to those that would often be, be 
viewed on the fringes of traditional society, to those that traditional society would exclude. Jesus actually is often depicted as taking issue with religious leaders of that day of how they understood what was required of God's people to be in relationship with him. And you'll see that the Pharisees kept on putting things on the back of people to do. You know what I mean? Have you ever seen like a, uh, you know, like, like, like a cheesy romance movie, you know, or something, or, or someone that's like in a bad relationship or whatever, and they'll make comments like, you know, well, if you love me, dot, 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 dot. If you love me, you'll do this. If, if you love me, you'll do that. With the Lord, it's different, right? With the Lord, it's different. We love the Lord, and the Lord loves us. Once we place our faith in him, once we place everything in him, the way we live changes as we become conformed to his image. But God's love is God's love. You can't earn it by doing something. Lord, if I work harder, will you love me more? No. The Lord loves you as much now as he's ever going to love you, which is a lot. Right? They were teaching that you could earn God's love. That you could earn it by doing stuff. So you could you could live your life and be a jerk. But if you were doing the right things, God would love you more. And that's not the way it works. That's not the way it works. I remember, I, I feel bad using these things as examples all the time. But I remember when, when I was um, 17 years old, and there was a summer that I was in, in, in Sicily. And we went, I, I really wanted to go see Corleone where they filmed The Godfather. Now, that area of Sicily is a notorious ma mafia country, a notorious mafia country, okay? And in fact, when we went to the cemetery, I wanted to go see the cemetery, and we went to the cemetery, and there was a, I've never seen a cemetery where there's a guard at the gate that told us we had to keep our cameras in the car. We couldn't walk in with our cameras into the cemetery, okay? And you would go in, and you would see these names of notorious, notorious mobsters. I mean, ones where their names were famous in Italy, right? And their tombstones were, I kid you not, were these statues of Jesus that were like 20 feet tall. And I mean, just every religious thing in the world. And I remember looking back and thinking, this was a bad guy. And look at what he wrote. Like, Almost thinking like, Lord, you know what? I'm going to do all of this bad, but at the end, I'm going to build a big statue of you, and you're going to let me in. And that's not the way it works. That's not the way it works in a way, and we'll see this as we go through the gospel. The Pharisees were telling that to the people. You need to do this. You need to do that. But you don't. So, And Jesus takes them to task on that. There's some key truths in this gospel in particular that we're going to highlight as we go through the next couple of months. First key truth is that Mark is writing to prove that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. That Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. He is the one that all of the prophets spoke of. He is the one that, I, that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were pointing to with their faith. Secondly, Jesus shows himself as the divine God, as God himself. He does some miracles, like when he stills the storm, and, and the apostles look at each other and they say, who is this guy, right? It's a, this has to be God. Because nobody can do this. Third thing, um, Jesus resists public recognition. And he chooses way more often to suffer humility with his people. There are many times as you go through the gospel where that's why sometimes I, I take the task of some people who classify Jesus as like this political, social justice warrior, whatever. There are many, many examples in the Bible where Jesus wanted to. He could have easily taken over the government with a lot of followers, and he did not. He did not. He chose to be with his people because Jesus knew that his kingdom wasn't controlling this and that here. His kingdom was of heaven. He was looking to save us spiritually, not physically. And lastly, we'll see that especially in Mark, Many, many examples of Jesus extending the gospel to the Gentiles. And it makes sense, right? If Mark is writing a gospel to a primarily Gentile audience looking to save them, why wouldn't he show all the examples of Jesus actually doing that with other Gentiles? 
right? He's not sitting around saying, well, yeah, Jesus is great, but he only goes to the house of Israel. No, Jesus saves anyone who places their faith in his name, right? That's kind of a background on Mark. We're, we're, gonna, we're going to, to touch more on these and expand them over the coming weeks and months, but that's just like a general background on Mark. And I would love it if you guys are really kind of feeling, you know, motivated, especially starting off the new year. Mark is a short gospel. Dedicate yourselves to reading the gospel of Mark every week, all the way through. It's quick. You can literally sit down and read the whole gospel of Mark in about 40 minutes at a normal clip, at a normal clip. A couple, couple days a week, 15, 20 minutes, you'll read the whole gospel every week. It's very good. Mark introduces his gospel, as we read today, kind of shifting into our message for today. Mark introduces his gospel with the character of John the Baptist, who is noted as uh, the, uh, the mark of God, the sign of God's faithfulness to God's people. John the Baptist, actually, what we're seeing with his introduction is the transition from the prophets of the Old Testament to the New Testament. John is that transition to the New Testament. Jesus, actually, in Luke chapter 7, calls John the greatest man who ever lived. In Luke 7, 28, Jesus says, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. That's how Jesus refers to John. What Jesus meant was that there was no one more focused on the kingdom of Jesus that was more focused on the kingdom of God than John the Baptist was. John never wavered in his mission. John was there to prepare the way, to herald the coming of the kingdom, to herald the coming of the Lord. As we read today, John is said to live in the wilderness, which, when you think about it in the grand scheme of the drama of scripture, John living in the wilderness is a natural allusion to the wilderness experience of Israel during the Exodus, right? Israel was in the wilderness just prior to entering the promised land. And now John is calling people to repentance in the wilderness just prior to the coming of Jesus. You see that natural transition there. John was the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth. It says here that he ate locusts and wore a hairy robe that was held together with a leather belt. John's clothing and his behavior was an obvious connection to the prophet Elijah from the time of the kings. John was actually sent to prison and ended up being beheaded for calling out Herod's illicit marriage to his sister-in-law. So at the beginning of this gospel in verse 4, again, just kind of coming right into it, verse 4 it says, And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. God spoke to John, brothers and sisters, and he obeyed. And when God speaks to us, especially when he speaks to us his will, we should listen and we should go. And we shouldn't try to improve it. We shouldn't try to change it. John taught repentance, right? How does God speak to us today? He speaks to us when we read the Bible. He speaks to us through his word. And when we read his word, we accept his word, we submit ourselves to the authority of his word, and we don't try to change it. We're not supposed to change it. And John taught a message of repentance. Now, what's repentance? Who, you know, here I'm, gonna, I, I, I'm always nervous when I do this. Who, who can tell me in an easy way what repentance is? Easy way. Man, I know we got some old schoolers in here with the Bible, so I don't, I don't, I don't want to be shy. What's, what's an easy way to understand repentance? To turn from your sin. Back coming through, right? To turn from your sin. So it's not just saying I'm sorry, right? Like, Lucy, I, I, I tell you guys this all the time. Lucy, how many times have I told you to put that away? I'm sorry. Well, you're not sorry because I told you to put it away yesterday and the day before or the day before that. So it's not just saying I'm sorry. Repentance is changing your heart, right? It actually means to turn. It actually means to turn around. So repentance means that I'm walking this way, and then I come to the Lord, and I say, no, I now am walking that way. I, 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 I'm putting my old self beyond, behind me, right? So John is, is teaching, telling the people what? Confess your sin, and then change, and then move on, right? And then move on. 
I'm going to make a confession to all of you. Big confession. You can probably tell. I have put way too much of my weight back on. I'm sick of it. And I am repenting. I am, I am turning my back on every single dessert that is at my house. Today, start today. I'm done. I told Lori, I'm like, I don't care what you do with it. You can put that out for animals. You can do whatever you want with it. Get that away from me. Honestly. Like, I told Lori yesterday, I'm going to start good today. And then she pulled the cheesecake out of the oven. And I'm like, <laughs> and then even better, then even better, then even better. Then Lori, Lucy comes in, and she forgot something in her car. And my car said, Lucy, can you please go in my car? She goes in my car, she gets it, she goes, Dad, by the way, what are these? Could you not? I've got like 17 pounds of chocolate covered peanuts that I got from the Kelsey's. <laughs> like, well, I don't know, like, what am I doing here? Right? This is like the worst. It's like when Jesus was tempted for 40 days. Before. But I have to turn from that because if I don't turn from that, I can tell you all, yeah, I got to lose some weight all I want. But if I don't turn from that, is it ever going to happen? No. I have to turn from it. I have to change. That's a, that's a silly way, a silly one to look at. But, but if, if you know you're struggling with a sin and you ask the Lord that you're sorry and you repent, the next step then is what? To turn and to change. Because if you keep saying sorry, right, and you don't change, I watched that 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 uh, short mini series or whatever it's called called Made about this this woman that's a maid that's in an abusive relationship that has to get out on Netflix. It's powerful. It's powerful. And I'll tell you what was hard to watch, knowing that my wife went through some some stuff with with her parents and stuff growing up in a tough relationship. But it's hard to watch. A man physically uh, uh, attack or, or, or physically put their hands on a woman and then say, I'm sorry, and then three days later just do it again like nothing. And then three days later do it again like nothing. You're not sorry. It's not changing. The behavior is not changing. You need to repent. You need to turn. And, and that's what John's calling us to. That's what, that's what Jesus is calling us to. To have a full life, brothers and sisters. We need to empty ourselves and go where God leads. Jesus is going to reinforce this very point, and we'll touch on that next week in the next week's message. So here we see that both John and Jesus emerged from the wilderness to start their public ministry, to preach to the people. And John is linking Jesus here to the promises of Israel's past. Jesus was 30 years old when he went to the Jordan River, where his cousin John was baptizing people. And Jesus was baptized by John for essentially two reasons. First, he was baptized by John to show that Jesus was the perfect son of God. This was his introduction. This is when we hear the voice of God saying, this is my son, right? And whom I am pleased. Secondly, it was to show that the perfect son of God came to earth for a specific reason, to fulfill his ministry. And Jesus is going to announce what his ministry is in the part that we read next week. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? Here it is. Brothers and sisters, by stepping into the Jordan River, what Jesus was saying is, I will become what you are. Whatever you are, whatever sin you have, whatever struggle you have, I will let the Father collect all your sins and place them all on me. And I'll take them to the cross for you. And you have to accept through faith, through belief. I read this great story illustration once. There's a Christian author. His name's Max Lucado. I'm sure some of you guys have heard of him. He's pretty, he's pretty popular and whatever. He's done a bunch of kids' books. But he told a story once of this kid who was in the backyard with his dad. And there was a, a little bird on the ground that had a, 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 a broken wing. And the, kid, the bird was like flailing around and he wanted to help this bird. So he went into the house and he got a little box and he went out to help the bird. But what happened every time he put the box next to the bird? The bird took off, right? The bird didn't want to go anywhere near where he was with the box, right? So he looked at his dad after several minutes of, of struggling and he said, Dad, I wish I could become a bird just so I could talk to this bird in a way that the bird would understand that I'm trying to help him and not hurt him. That's what Jesus did when he came to this earth as a man. 
so that he can speak to you in a way that you can understand. To let you know that he's here to save you, not to hurt you. That's what Jesus did. Think back to when you placed your faith in Jesus. You called out to the Lord in faith. And Jesus picked up the tab at that point for all your sins, past, present, and future. At that point, when you place your faith in God, you became a child of his through faith, through repentance, your former way of life. And God put his, his stamp on your heart. He sealed your heart that you belong to him. Today, Jesus calls us all to stand before him and be honest. In Jesus, we can see how beautiful God has made us and that life is better if we follow Jesus Christ. Because of the lives of John and Jesus, we can say with confidence, I'm forgiven so that I can go forth and be like Christ, forgive others. I'm loved so that I can go forth and be like Christ and love others. I'm empowered by the Holy Spirit so that every day I can live my life in faith and that I'm given a mission by God so that I can be a person who loves to serve the Lord. And that's the question for today. As crazy as it sounds and as crazy as the last year has been, today is the last Sunday of 2021. The last Sunday of 2021. And there's a question that you all need to answer. What is your mission? What is your mission for God? What is your mission in the kingdom of heaven? How does God want you to serve him? And what is your role? What is your role in the church? And I don't necessarily mean church with the little C. I mean church with the big C. What is your role in the church? And are you ready to follow that mission wherever it leads? And to see what ministry or where you fit in in the kingdom. Brothers and sisters, I think we should make 2022 a year of devotion to Jesus. A year where we really devote our lives to him. A year where we earnestly seek to understand what is my role in this kingdom of God. What is my role? Because each of you has a role. Each of you has a role that you serve in the kingdom. The question always comes up, how can I know my role in the kingdom? How do I know? How do I know what God wants me to do? Well, you find that out by seeking and asking. And how do we seek and ask the Lord? Well, we do that through relying on the spiritual disciplines. We pray as a discipline. And through prayer, you're communicating with the Lord, understanding, getting, getting yourself to understand what your will is for God through your Bible. Read the word. It nourishes you daily. If you need a little bit of accountability on Facebook, join our Bible reading challenge. We're going to start up again on January 1st to read through the Bible in a year. Every day, every word, as it nourishes the inside of your soul. If you're praying and you're reading your Bible, you're meditating on the word of God. You're spending time devoted to listening to the word of God. Journaling is a great way to have God speak to you. To sit down with your Bible and something to write with. To see what thoughts, anything that God is placing on you, to, to capture that and to write out to God where your heart is. Fasting, right? And by fasting, I'm not talking about like, you know, going three days without eating and stuff like that. But sometimes it's just to miss a meal and to tell the Lord, Lord, I'm going to focus on you during this hour. Those kinds of ways to, to, to bring the, the will and the submission to the Lord and service. Serving the kingdom, whether it's in service to the church, whether it's in service to your community, but doing it in the name of the Lord. Those are all ways that will help you to find what your mission is in the kingdom and what your role is. These are all ways that we can bring our lives into submission to the Lord and understand what our mission is. So as we close here today, that's the prayer. As we stand here on the threshold of 2022, as we stand here on the, on the, the mark of, of starting a, a new reading 
through the gospel to truly, like John understood his role and Jesus understood his role, for us to understand our role in the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, be with us and help us, Lord, like John, who knew that his mission was to announce the coming of the Messiah, like Jesus, who knew that his mission was to come to this earth to take on our sins, to die, to forgive our sins, to give us grace and salvation through faith, Lord. Let us seek to understand our mission. Lord, we love you. And sometimes we fight it, and sometimes we fight you. But help us, Lord, to truly seek after you and to understand your role and your mission for our lives. We love you so much, Jesus. Be with us always. And we ask for this in your precious name. Amen. You know, before I close, one thing popped into my head as I pray. Sometimes people wonder, you know, what is my role supposed to be? Am I supposed to be like John the Baptist? Go stand outside on 44 and tell everyone that Jesus is coming? Do I need to be like Jesus? Do I need to be a pastor? Do I need to go no, you don't have to do any of those things. God calls you to it. You do. But what can it look like to serve? And a thought just occurred to me. When I first came to the Lord, it was what now? 18, 18 years ago? 17 years ago, 18 years ago? Sally was only like six, six years old, seven years old, something like that. And we were going, we were attending um, Brookside and Methodist Church. And, I, and she used to come early with me to go to Bible school, to go to Bible study. She used to come early. And there was this nice man, his name was Dave, who brought the donuts every week. And there they did it a little different because they would set the donuts down, they would cut them in half, right? And sit there and cut them in half. Here, we get the whole donut. But there they would cut it in half. And Sally used to love to go there, and she would stand there, and she would watch. And the very first donut that he would cut, she would take the first half, right? She was so excited, right, to get that donut. When we told them that we were leaving, to start to start that little church in Tehomage, um, by that time, Sally was, was 11 or something like that. And she came in with me, and she said, I don't know, maybe 10, I don't know. And he was cutting the donuts, and she was waiting there to get her first half of the donut. And she said to him, thank you for always bringing the donuts. And so he looked at her and said, you're welcome, Sally. He said, now, you're going with somewhere else. They're going to need someone to do the donuts. Can you do the donuts at your church? And she said, yes. So we were meeting at Talmadge. Every morning I would get up early and Sally would say, Dad, I'll go with you because I got to put out the donuts, right? That was her little service to the Lord. I'm sure that Dave didn't know the impact that, that would have on a little kid just putting out the donuts every week. But sometimes it's something like that to show the Lord. And Dave does a lot of things in the church. But sometimes it's a little thing like that to just say, Lord, this is my little niche in the kingdom that I'm going to serve for you. Even earnestly seek those things because everyone has something that they can be doing for the Lord. Cheryl. Please stand and turn in your hymnals to page 508. 